Hi, it's Justin Clody of Sonic Scoop, and welcome back for some more MixCon. Today, we have on a great producer, engineer, mixer by the name of Mark Urselli. Mark is a three-time Grammy winner who works not only in the studio, but also in live sound, doing front of house with some major artists. He's worked with the likes of U2, Foo Fighters, Nick Cave, Lou Reed, Sting, John Zorn, and so many more. He's worked in rock, pop, metal, jazz, experimental genres, really all over the map. And today he's going to be taking us through a masterclass that is not only about mixing, but about where the mix starts, about the fact that the mix starts with the microphones. He is going to be taking us through a look at mic techniques and microphone choices in the context of the mix to give us a sense of what tracks should sound like before you even get to the mixing stage and how you might treat live played instruments in the mix with a special focus on exactly how to get good sounds out of them to begin with on the recording end. He's going to be taking us through two different songs in two different genres to get an idea for his favorite techniques, favorite mic placements on a variety of instruments, and then how he processes those raw sounds, how they sound when they start out at the beginning of the mix, and just how far he takes them by the end of the mixing process. Like all MixCon masterclasses, this one is free to the public thanks to our sponsors, and the sponsor on this one is a natural fit. It is Jay-Z Microphones. Mark Urselli has been using Jay-Z Microphones for years. He even has a custom-made stereo microphone that Jay-Z built special just for him, and he has a whole bunch of their regular mics as well, one of his personal favorites being the Jay-Z Black Hole. And we'll hear a variety of their microphones and others in the session today. And Mark is even going to take us on a tour of his mic locker, looking at not only his condenser microphones, but also his favorite dynamic and ribbon microphones. He's got a huge collection of those, and he'll give us his tasting notes on a whole bunch of microphones and his recommended applications for each. Speaking of microphones, I am talking into a Jay-Z microphone right now. I use Jay-Z microphones all the time on the Sonic Scoop podcast and in the videos. Right now, I'm talking to my Jay-Z Amethyst, which is a really full-bodied but extremely detailed condenser. This one is an amazing value like so many of the Jay-Z microphones. I encourage you to go check them out. We'll have a link to their website down in the description and in the comments. But while these microphones are a tremendous value, you can also get one for free because right now we are giving away $5,000 worth of free gear in the MixCon mega giveaway. We're giving away mics, we're giving away speakers, we're giving away plugins, we're giving away all sorts of stuff and you have three chances to win. So go look for the MixCon mega giveaway if you're checking out this video when it comes out. We'll have the link to that in the description and the comments down below as well. If you're liking what you see here, remember to hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notifications bell so you don't miss any more MixCon videos when they come out. Better yet, go over to sonicscoop.com, sign up for our newsletter there, and we will inform you via email whenever we have a new MixCon video coming your way. One more quick note, we are doing a live Q&A with Mark as soon as this main masterclass concludes. We'll have the link to that in the description and in the comments down below. If you have any questions and you're catching the live premiere of this masterclass, just type them into the chat box on your screen. I'll be saving the best questions for that live Q&A coming up right after this masterclass is over. All right, without any further ado, let's get right into it. Mark Urselli, take it away. Hi, my name is Mark Urselli. I'm a Grammy Award-winning engineer and producer. I am the chief engineer at Eastside Sound, the studio in which I am currently sitting, which is also where I've recorded and mixed the tracks you're about to hear. I want to thank MixCon and Sonic Scoop. I've done a previous MixCon presentation about my mixing template. A lot of that information applies to this, so if you have not seen that, I encourage you to go look for that on the Sonic Scoop website. I also want to thank Jay-Z Microphones. Jay-Z is a Latvian brand of condenser microphones that I've been using ever since the company started. I love their microphones, especially the BH-1S, which is one of my favorite vocal microphones. And the little brother of the BH-1S is the BB-29, which you see here, and that I'm actually using here as a vocal mic for this presentation. JC has definitely been very present in my studio for a long time, and you will see more about JC when I take you to the mic locker of Eastside Sound, which is one of 
the most amazing places. I love to be in the studio. By the way, Eastside Sound is the oldest studio in New York City. It's been opened in 1968 by Lou Holtzman, and it's currently owned by Andres Pollack. Both Lou and Andres have a deep love for recording music at the highest quality. And so I'm very proud to be the chief head audio engineer at Eastside Sound and to be involved in a studio that has such an amazing jazz history. And since we're talking about jazz history, let's start with the first track from this presentation, which is the great George Coleman. George Coleman is an 89-year-old incredible saxophone player who has played with Miles Davis, Herbie Hancock, just to mention two of the most influential musicians of our time, but also with a slew of many, many, many other people. He's an incredible saxophone player and jazz composer. And I've had the great pleasure and honor to record and mix his newest album, which is at the time of this shooting, not even out yet. So depending on when this will be out, I don't know if it'll come out before the record or not, but you might be hearing something absolutely for the first time. The same is true for the other two songs I'll be playing you, which are by David J of Bauhaus. David J is the bass player of Bauhaus. He's also in Love and Rockets, and he has done a new record that I've produced, recorded and mixed here at Eastside Sound. And you'll be hearing two songs from that album, also unreleased as of yet. So I'm gonna start by playing you this George Coleman track called Five Four Thing. First, I'm gonna play you actually the rough mix. The rough mix is basically what came directly from the other side of the glass over there, which I'll show you later, by the way. So you'll hear George talking at the beginning, counting it off. I'll play you a minute of that, and then we'll stop and I'll play you the track. Here's the rough mix. So that's the rough mix. You get the idea. This is what's happening. This was happening while the band was playing. This was take one, which is actually the take we ended up mixing. The band only played two uh, takes. In the band, we had drums, bass, uh, electric guitar, piano, uh, who also played on certain songs, B3 and Wurlitzer, and of course, George playing his beautiful saxophone. We also had some songs with vocals and group vocals, clapping, and on those vocals I've used a very special microphone made by Jay-Z specifically for me, which I will show you later when I take you to the mic locker. But for now, I'll play you the mix of the two. That's it. That's a great George Coleman, an absolute legend of the jazz world. As you've seen, and as you can see from the screen, there's very minimal automation. I tend to actually keep the volume automation shown where there is volume automation, which means if you're seeing the 
waveform, the waveform rather than the volume automation, like for the drums, there is no volume automation or the bass, there is no volume automation. So, you know, that's just my way of organizing my Pro Tools session so that I can see where I have done any automation of any kind. I do the same when I do send automation, I leave that unfolded so I can see it. But before I talk about this specific track, I wanna talk about the ways in which I mix music at Eastside Sound, because there's three separate mixing scenarios. The first approach is to mix everything on the analog console, use inserts, outboards, analog outboard, do my mix, save the mix, take photos of the outboard, take notes of whatever settings I need to recall in case I need to recall and finish the mix. The second approach is to mix it completely in the box so that I can work on it on the plane, at home, etc., etc. And the third approach, which is the one I'm using in this scenario and as well in the next two songs I'll be playing you, is the hybrid approach. The hybrid approach allows me to get 80, 90% of the work done at home, on my laptop, on my speakers, while traveling with headphones, etc., etc. I get it 80, 90% there. I send the mix to the client for approval. I make changes the client might request. And then I bring it into the studio and I spread out the outputs on the console. And I use a little bit of outboard where necessary, particularly on the mix bus. That's the approach I'm using today. So what you're hearing here, and you will be hearing the next two songs, is a hybrid approach of plugins and outboard where the outboard I'm using is primarily the Manly Passive EQ and the Shadow Hills Mastering Compressor. But that's in addition to whatever I'm doing here. So basically I'm using compressors, EQs, etc., as plugins so that I can work in the box. And the other key component to this is that I'm doing analog summing from the console. So this console, as I mentioned before, it's called the Neve Genesis, allows me to have two layers a analog layer, which is this, uh, and a digital DAW controlling layer, which is the one that talks to Pro Tools. So I basically, on my analog layer, I get my first levels. I usually start with all faders at zero and make whatever changes I want to make once I'm hearing it here in the studio. And then on the digital layer, I do my automation. So that's the mix approach we're discussing today. So basically we have a drum set which is recorded with dynamic condenser, snare top and bottom, hi-hat, tom one, tom three, which was the floor tom, and two mics on the overhead. That sounds like this. Then there's upright bass. I always record upright bass with two microphones, a small diaphragm condenser on the bridge, or pointed at the fingerboard uh, and a large diaphragm condenser in front of the F hole. That sounds like this. You can hear it even the snapping of the finger against the other finger or the fingerboard. And the large diaphragm sounds like this. That's gonna be fuller and rounder. Piano is actually very interesting because I record piano with two microphones right over about a foot over the strings. I'll show you those microphones later when we go into the live room. But I also recorded a room mic and this is where I used another one of my Jay-Z microphones. One that unfortunately you can never have because it was custom designed for me. And when we go to the mic locker, I will show you that microphone. That microphone, which sounds like this, is the room mic. I mix the two signals together and they sound like this. Now I always record the I and amp for safety and in case I want to do a stereo thing with an amp simulator on the DI and a real amp. But also we have this beautiful amp locker with about 10 different amps to choose from that a guitar player can plug into from anywhere in Eastside Sound. Eastside, when we do the, the walkthrough, you'll see has six ISO boots around the live room. So I actually had the guitar player sitting 
in the live room with the piano player and that guitar goes into the eye and I believe on this session he was using my um, twin reverb amp. Those two signals together sound like this. Last but not least, certainly not least, we have George Coleman, who is the star of this uh, song. I recorded George with two microphones, a condenser and a ribbon, and this is how I usually record horns. Now, once we go to the mic locker, you will see that I'm a huge lover and a user of ribbon microphones. I have one of the largest collections of ribbon mics. I'm very proud of that collection. In that collection, there's a ton of incredible microphones, one of which I've used on this recording, and that sounds like this. Now, the condenser mic is much brighter, so you'll hear when I unsolo the ribbon and solo the condenser. Together, they sound like this. Now, if you've paid close attention, you will also have heard that the reverb tails from those two mics come from the left and the right speaker. And that's because I tried to create a little bit of stereo ambience, leaving the saxophone panned in the middle. He is the star, we want him in the middle, but we want to also want to create this oral excitement of stereo imagery. And I did that with just sending the two mics to two different reverbs. I know I've talked to you about the template, so I don't want to go too deep into the template again, but I will say this. If you look at my mix template, you see that there's plus signs next to these buses. That is because I have a Pro Tools template that allows me to effortlessly switch between digital in the box and analog mixing in the studio. So, for example, if you look at the drum bus, the drums here go to the drum bus right here. The drum bus, which is this one, see, input the drums, goes to two different signals. It goes to my instrumental bus, it also goes to a physical output one and two. You can see if I hover over, it will say instrumental bus and one and two. And that is true for all of these channels. The reverb drums will go to the drum bus into one and two. The percussion will be to going through uh, the instrumental bus and to three and four physical output. So that's the way I have all the groups of tracks of this session going to the physical layer, but I can control them from the digital layer and I can switch back and forth. This means that I can work on this mix here and then go back home and work on it in the box and then come back here and it'll open and still allow me to use analog summing. Because I'm talking about analog summing, I will also mention the mix bus, which is in this case, and it's not always the same, but in this case, I am using a Manly Massive Passive, which is a beautiful equalizer, which you can buy for about eight grand. And if you have another 10 or 11 grand to throw around, you can buy the Shadow Hills Mastering Compressor. In fact, if you look at that, You can see it's working, but it's not working very hard. The reason why it's not working very hard is because I do my final limiting, multiband limiting actually, with the ML4000 plugin by Mac DSP. Now, if you go back to the MixCon where I talked about the uh, mix template, which I encourage you to do, you will see why I have these two mix buses. Uh, but I'll go over it very quickly here. I always record two mixes, which is this one, which says NC, and this one, which says M. NC stands for non-compressed, and that's the one I sent to the mastering engineer, and M stands for mastered. That's my version of the master, which is the one I sent to the client, to the artist to approve, and it's the one that will give a mastering engineer who cares to listen to my finished uh, mastered quote unquote mix. It's basically a compressed mix that's louder than the non-compressed. In certain instances, the mastering engineer wants to hear what I've done, in others they don't, but I'm gonna give them both options. And the way that works is 
all of these tracks that I've showed you that go to drums, keys, bass, guitars, they all go to my instrumental bus, but also to my physical outputs. Out of those physical outputs, they go to this fader, which is the master fader of the console. Out of that, through inserts, goes into the Massive Passive and the Shadow Hills Mastering Compressor, which, like I said, is only for this song and uh, the next two songs, but I don't. I also use other outboard. Goes back into the console via inserts and then goes through this bus summing RF to these two bus sums with the limiter at the end. So I do my final limiting with that. And then that goes to these two tracks, which are recorded. That basically explains the mix bus chain. Uh, and now I'm going to take you to another tune and show you the David J album that I'm producing. Okay, so this mix breakdown, as you can see, there's a little bit more going on compared to the previous George Coleman jazz session. There are drums, and as I explained earlier, I like to keep open the tracks that have automation so I can remind myself of what's going on, or even reverb automation, like in this case on the snare. There's some uh, reverb automation on the floor tom, there's some automation over the overhead, but very minimal, as you can see. Uh, the drums in this track were recorded by Phil Puleo, the drummer of Swans. He's a great drummer who's used to playing very hard with Swans. I had him play quiet, quietly for the most part. So that's our drum sound very reverby, very watery, very spacey, because that's what I thought as the producer that the track required. There's also, remember how before I told you about the stereo mic that Jay-Z made for me? I've also used that stereo mic as a room mic for the drums. Now, Phil loves to play a dulcimer. So he had a dulcimer, hammer dulcimer set up next to him on his left side. And the mic that is called room here in the session was really the dulcimer mic, and that's down here. I'm gonna drag this up here real quick. The dulcimer was an overdub because the drums, you know, there's, first of all, he was playing the drums, but also physically, the dulcimer is so much quieter than the drums that you can't really have them in the same room and have a good level on the dulcimer. So what I did is, you can see, it was originally called dulcimer because that's the dulcimer mic, but I called the track room mic because in this section here, in the loud section, I've actually used a dulcimer mic, which is the stereo Jay-Z microphone I'll show you later in the mic locker, as the room mic. It sounds like this, very compressed. Super crushed, but together with the drums, it's like, it goes like this. Now I've only used this in this section of the song. As you can see, the rest of the song, it's grayed out. I didn't use it. I wanted a much cleaner sound, none of that distortion. But the dulcimer with that stereo Jay-Z microphone sounds like this. Tons of reverb on this as well. Obviously, as you might have gathered, guessed, this is a very reverby album by choice piano of course the fretless bass by the amazing david j i love fretless bass and so working with david was really a uh, pleasure. In the loud part here, I added some distortion with a plugin by Mac, uh, by uh, Melda, which I love using, the M-Distortion MB. Even added some chorus. So that's the loud part we've heard before. This little FX 
thing is just a reverse, a reverb off of David's vocal, which I've used as a reintroduction of sections of the song. And there's, of course, David's voice. Hello, child. It's a... You can see also this automation here. That's automation on the reverb and on the delay below. And again, I keep those open to show myself when I reopen this file later what I've been doing on this song. And then there's another uh, Jay-Z microphone used in this song, which is the mic on the background vocals, which are these. These vocals uh, were um, by the piano because the pianist, Paul Walfish, is also a singer and therefore I needed another uh, microphone that I really trust. The Jay-Z Black Hole has been one of my absolute all-time favorite vocal mics. I own two of them because I like them so much. And so that's the one I put on the piano vocal. And then there's guitar. This is Johnny Polonsky, who's an amazing guitar player who lives in LA. Again, like with the jazz session from before, there are there is a DI and there's an amp and to get together they sound like this. And then there's an overdub. And finally, there's a harmonium. The harmonium was played by Paul Wolfish, the piano player, and it was recorded with the Jay-Z Black Hole as well. Jay-Z has been used a bunch in this session. You can see from the, if I zoom out on the session, that they've done five takes and that we've used the fifth take. That's the one where I've done all my mixing, basically. The rest is the same with one key difference, which is actually very cool. It's a trick that I've shown people before and they've, they were a little flabbergasted by that because not a lot of people think about the analog hiss that comes when you're using analog equipment, even if it's high quality, incredible equipment like the Shadow Hills or the Manly, Compre the Manly Massive Passive, when you add all of this stuff together, plus the whatever 24, 32 open faders on an analog console, inevitably you're gonna get a little bit of hiss, which is very, very minimal because it's high quality equipment, but it's there. In order to remove that, what I do is I put a spectral denoise plugin by Isotope on the master bus so that I can basically listen to the hiss that's generated by the entire chain of analog equipment, remove that hiss by learning the hiss, obviously. You click learn and it learns the hiss. You can see it's very, very minimal. And you remove that and you can use the reduction threshold settings to see how much you want to remove without affecting. This is on the master bus, so you have to be very, very minimal and very, very conservative with this approach because you don't want to absolutely reduce the quality in any way of the master bus. I only do it on ballads and quiet songs. So on the song before, the George Coleman, that wasn't even there. I forgot to point it out, but it wasn't there. On this song, it's there because it's a much quieter song. So if you're going to hear hiss anywhere, it would be on a ballad, on a quiet song. That's why it's here for this, because it's very quiet at the beginning. You can see for the, from the waveform how quiet it's at the beginning, especially on the version going to the mastering engineer. I want to make sure it's absolutely clean. Um, and that's all for this tune. Eagle,
nice long reverb coda, little final guitar chord. I don't need to repeat myself because it's the same session from the previous song, so it's the same exact microphones, it's the same exact track count pretty much. There's no dulcimer overdub, there's no harmonium overdub, there's a couple of background vocal overdubs, which were put on with the Jay-Z Black Hole. The lead vocal here is the Jay-Z Black Hole. Oh, there is, this, this thing is maybe of interest, the fact that I have a print VCA, which basically is connected to all of the buses in my uh, template. You can see plus 2.2 here, zero plus 2.2, plus four. So what that does is it turns up all my subgroups and physical outputs, uh, wherever there's a plus, uh, by 4 dBs in this case. What that does is it makes the mix louder, but it makes the compressor work harder. So whenever I want to make the shadow hills, in this case, compressor work harder, I send more signal out. So I can also decide the level of compression that I want to, or the level of at which the compressor should work so that we don't hear the compressor, but we can achieve optimal leveling. And again, like with all the other songs, you can see there's two mixes, one non-compressed, one mastered. I think that just about sums it up for this mix presentation here in the control room. Now we're gonna go take a look at the live room where I'll be talking about where these different microphones and musicians were placed so that you can have a visual um, uh, reference of what you just heard. Thank you so much for watching. Again, my name is Mark Urselli. You can check out my website on markurselli.com. That's M-A-R-C-U-R-S-E-L-L-I. I am happy to answer any questions if you email me. So I hope to hear from you soon. Welcome to the Eastsight Sound Mic Locker. This is one of my favorite spaces in this room. It uh, is a place where three different mic collections have come together. Eastsight Sound, founded in 1968 by Lou Holtzman, has a lot of mics in here. Uh, Andres Pollack, the new owner of Eastsight Sound, had a studio in South America, which he brought here. So there's a ton of microphones here from his collection. And then there is my collection, which is mostly ribbon microphones because I love ribbon microphones. And actually my collection is not all here, but some of the most important pieces are here. So the way I have organized this mic locker is by prominence and type. For example, on this shelf, we have all Japanese ribbon microphones. So there's 1960s, 1930s, 1940s, 1960s, all different stuff. Here there's all Neumanns. We have all the usual suspects you have a K-24s, U-47s, U-67s, U-57s, U-M-57s, U-M basically every number, 67, 47, 57, 67, 77, 87, they're all here. There's more of them down here, the new M-49s, the vintage U-67 tube mics. Then we have more ribbons here. So we have Italian ribbons. I grew up in Italy, so I've been scouring those Italian audio markets for great ribbons from Italy, British ribbons, American ribbons, and Polish and French ribbons down here. And then there's of course the RCA shelf with all the classic RCAs. But last, last but not least, there is the Jay-Z microphones shelf. So in this shelf, we have some of the uh, Jay-Z microphones that I've been using on, that, on these sessions uh, from this mix presentation. In particular, there is the Jay-Z Black Hole, of which I own two. There's the BH-1 and the BH-1S. This is the BH-1S. Now, Jay-Z mics, this is one of my favorite vocal mics. It's also the mic you've heard on uh, the background vocals and Paul's vocals on the David J record. This mic has a beautiful shock mount, which Jay-Z does not make anymore, uh, but which I use with much pleasure because it has a built-in pop filter. So the mic slides in like that, and you can adjust the the uh, distance that you want on the sh on the pop filter. So this is very, very convenient. 
and I use this I have this in its own special case so even the shock mount gets a special case but to show you a few other mics that are not Jay-Z in the RCA shelf I'm gonna take out one of the oldest RCA's the RCA KU3A this is the microphone that was used to record George Coleman's saxophone this is a wonderful heavy RCA ribbon microphone in perfect working condition maybe not perfect aesthetic condition but I love this mic so much it's a unidirectional microphone which is rare among ribbon microphones uh, but in the early days of RCA 30s and early 40s they were still doing a unidirectional microphone before they went to figure eight so here's some other very cool microphones this this right here is also known as the skunk microphone this is the KU2A it's called the skunk microphone because it's got the white thing to signal the back in case the words back were not clear enough obviously this is the front where the RCA logo is I do have the original shock mount which you know you put put the mic through it's a very heavy microphone unidirectional microphone like I said early days RCA's that's what they were doing another great microphone of which I own four is the Melodium 42B this is a beautiful ribbon microphone from the 1940s perfect condition aesthetically speaking perfect working condition this is the vintage version not the 42BN which is the new version with XLR this is a 42B which has the old French connector so these are beautiful there's some very rare microphones like the Allocchio Bacchini an Italian mic from the 1920s I'll show you that real quick that's a precursor or maybe not precursor but same time of the RCA 44 which I have one down there super heavy microphone super rare microphone I've looked I've tried for years to find this microphone and they only made this company only made two microphones and I have both of them uh, in the world of the ribbon microphones from England which was another great place look at this beautiful military style box wooden box of his master's voice this is the EMI PM245 this microphone which comes in this old school military box still has the EMI logo on it the dog on one side and the logo on the metal chassis this was there are two versions of this this is the version that you can hang and it's a ribbon mic with which I've recorded, for example, the new album of uh, Dave Liebman, another Miles Davis saxophone player. I've been very lucky in my life to work with some of the best musicians on the planet. And I think that about covers it. I mean, there's many, many other microphones. The beauty of a mic locker like this is to have options and to know what works best. So let's go to the live room and I'll show you how and where some of these mics were placed. Welcome to the live room at East Side Sound. You're seeing half of it. The other half is on the other side of the camera. In this half, you can see three boots. There's the amp room back there. I'll take you there in a second. There's a booth where I usually put upright bass. Uh, so for the George Coleman uh, record, I had the upright bass player in there. For the David J. I had the electric bass in there with the microphone for David J's vocal and that the reason why I wanted to put David J there is because the other singer was Paul Walfish who was on the black hole Jay-Z black hole right here at the piano so Paul had a piano as well as a vintage keyboard I forget what he used something he brought and my 
uh, Wurlitzer and my Rhodes set up here so you could play everything and always see David J through that class. The other person that they needed to see was the drummer, who's Phil Puleo. The drum set is behind these glass doors. So I'll take you in that booth also, but what is interesting about these doors is that these doors open so you can slide the piano in and out of that room. So we can do piano in there and drums in here when it's a big rock record and we want a big drum sound. Or if it's jazz, like a lot of what we do here, we keep the drum set out there and the piano in here. And then behind the camera, there's three other booths where I had George Coleman set up. The guitar player on both the George Coleman and the David J session was actually in here with the piano player because they were both electric guitar players and therefore uh, no sound made into the piano mics. But the cool thing about the amp room is that we have about 10 different combo amps as well as head and cabinets. We have two different cabinets to choose from and six or seven different uh, guitar heads as well as a couple of bass cabinets. There's super rare things like Chandler RCA. There's a very rare Geloso, an Italian uh, guitar amp. Then there's the classics like Fender DeVille, Twin Reverb. There's, there's a lot of choices and the amp room is, is uh, wired so that you can have the guitar player anywhere in these rooms or in the control room send his signal to that amp room. And then the amp room is also mic'd up with two microphones so you can have say a 57 and a ribbon mic on top of the whatever guitar amp you choose to use. So in the drum booth, we usually have either this set, which is the DW house set, or we have two vintage Rogers bebop sizes jazz sets that the jazz drummers love and use all the time. And then of course the drummer bring, can bring their own drums if they so prefer or choose to. But I have to say a lot of drums are impressed by our drum collection, especially the vintage Rogers. So they love to play those drums and not have to carry theirs. I usually record drum overheads with AKG 414s. You're seeing those set up here. Or if it's a rock record, I might set up Cole's ribbon mics. I use MD-421s for toms, I use a 57 and an 81 for snare, and I use a Lewitt dual element uh, dynamic condenser on the kick drum. That about sums it up for the live room at Eastside Sound. I hope you found that uh, interesting and enjoyable. We are located in New York City. I encourage you to come down and visit us, and I'll be happy to give you a tour. And if you, anyone wants to record here, uh, you're seeing how versatile this setup is. We make all sorts of records here, jazz, rock, classical music. The songs you heard in the control room were all recorded here, so you can hear how those sounds translate in a finished mix. We have a beautiful Steinway uh, piano with Renner Action, 1981 New York Steinway. We have a B3, we have Wurlitzer Rhodes, three drum sets, tons of amps. There's choices, so come on by. All right, I hope you enjoyed that mixing masterclass as much as I did. Mark did a tremendous job taking us through not only mixes, but also mic techniques and mic choices. So a lot of fun seeing his mic locker. Big thanks again, not only to Mark, but also to Jay-Z Microphones for helping make this one free to the public. Mark is a big lover of Jay-Z Microphones. He has a whole bunch of theirs, and so do I. Right now, I'm talking to one of my favorite mics for voice and voiceover, and it is this Jay-Z Amethyst Microphone. These are an incredible value. This one is a great full-bodied, but still detailed sounding condenser mic. I absolutely love it. It also looks cool too, which is a lot of fun. And even though these things are a tremendous value at full price, we are giving away some Jay-Z microphones right now. Check out the MixCon mega giveaway. There's three chances to win more than $5,000 worth of free gear. So definitely check it out. Sign up. We'll have the link to that in the description and in the comments down below. And good luck to you. If you were here for the live premiere of this masterclass, be sure to check out the live Q&A that's coming up right after this. I hope to see you over there getting started right about now.